Today's going to be a fun, interesting, and different show. My guest today, who's really not so much a guest, more of a co-pilot, if you will, is the awesome Revolution Radio's resident military historian, Douglas Dietrich. And uh, we're going to be going over a plethora of things involving your personal preparedness post-world of law and order, where you may need to defend oneself from other such miscreants who do no longer fear a state that we cannot rely on to protect us if it indeed gets to that point. First off, I'm going to allow Doug to talk a little bit about Lorian Fenton's Super Soldier Summit as a favor to the great Lorian Fenton. Douglas has a few things that he wants to say about that event. So, Doug, how are yeah. you doing? You unmuted? Good. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, doing better now that I'm uh, speaking with a good friend of mine, Steve Travesty, and I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be here with Steve Travesty's regular audience and any new listeners who may have joined us tonight. Really thank you for presenting me with this opportunity, and boy, do I need it. I just got off of Godlike Productions, and I'm hoping people will access as well the audio archives of Godlike Productions for the interview that was conducted today. So whatever the uh, date is today, which I believe it's uh, the 23rd when I started that interview with Godlike, and it ended on the 24th. But uh, if you make sure to look up there, Wednesday the 23rd of uh, April interview, you'll hear me in a uh, knockdown, dragout fight on the air that will entertain and educate you uh, is the conflict between, as Mr. Travesty was kind enough to explain, a military historian and the normal f people who live by fantasy in the United States and the fantasies of history, uh, which have led us to the point where we're at now, where Mr. Travesty and I have to discuss the potential of militant survivalism in a uh, you know, condition uh, of anarchy. And the reason why we have gotten to this point where we are degenerating towards anarchy is because the American paradigm, uh, having nothing to do with the American people, but rather a paradigm imposed on them by the Constitutional Republic of the United States, this paradigm has not served the American people well. This paradigm has led us to a auto-destruction in the same sense that any pseudo-scientific paradigm would. To put this into perspective, if one were to follow the medievalist logic of uh, birds flying and admiring or observing the flight of birds, and if one were to take a non-Da Vincian approach, which was a Renaissance approach, as to, opposed to trying to emulate the mechanical aspects of the bird's flight, instead taking a classical Hellenic Grecan approach of pre-Aristotelian logic and just gluing feathers all over yourself or all over an automobile and assuming that the feathers will bring you flight since every bird that you've seen fly has feathers. If you roll that car tarred and covered in feathers off of a cliff, it's not going to fly. Or if you leap off of a building tarred and feathered, you're not going to fly. But my point is, this is what the paradigm has done to the United States. We've been operating on foundations of sand and quicksand. And uh, whatever structures we build upon it in terms of our paradigm, in terms of our axioms, are uh, quickly disintegrating because the foundations are false. So you get to hear that if you check out the um, live raw feed Godlike Productions archives, and I do recommend that everyone do that. Hopefully it is an interview which will live in famy and infamy uh, and get spread and viral all over the Internet and, and help promote the truth and uh, what I'm all about and what Mr. Travesty is all about. Now, as for Lorian Fenton, I am, of course, uh, indebted to her as my manager. Uh, she's going through some very hard times. Uh, do contact her at Lorian at DouglasDietrich.com and uh, just... Just as if you can help the station, if you can help her in any way, shape, or form, even with just moral support, uh, don't be afraid to contact her, Lorian at DouglasDietrich.com. As for the Super Soldier Summit, we will be holding that on the weekend of May 17th, 18th, and 19th, I believe. And the way to find out for sure is to go to www.SuperSoldierSummit.com. And uh, our website was attacked and knocked down day after day. It probably took a month and the loss of about $10,000 of well, go figure. Douglas is in the middle of a diatribe about being kicked off the internet, and Douglas gets kicked off the internet. I, I mean, like, are they doing this because they think it's funny? Uh, yes. I, Douglas, there you are. Yes. Oh, my God. I was God, just I making the it. comment that while you were going off on a diatribe about getting kicked off the internet, you yeah. got kicked off the internet. 
uh, you know, it really tells us something. But yeah. at any rate, it, it tells us to say hello to the NSA. Hey guys, how's it going? Yeah, it's it's very frustrating. But this is part of uh, you know, one could ask the way James Arthur Yanchik has validly and legitimately asked. How can, uh, you know, why don't they just take you off the air completely? And uh, the, they've got problems. First off, the example of William Cooper is an exa excellent example. If they kill you, uh, you personally, not your relatives, they kill you. They make a martyr of you, and everybody begins to take seriously what you said. If they cut you off the air, then people know you've been cut off the air. And uh, basically, that gives validity to what you've said. And one way or another, people will find out some way to find out what it is you're trying to say. But if they continually make it difficult, inconvenient, frustrating, and just maddening to listen to you with constant interruptions, then they get people to tune out. And that, it's like having a person who stutters while he speaks. They, in a subconscious way, discredit the speaker because the technical issues make him look unprofessional even though he or his staff or the radio station from which he is sourcing are in no way, shape, or form responsible for these interruptions, it somehow subconsciously is imbued on them as a professional lack. And they are considered to be found wanting in public eyes, and then the public stops listening to them. So that is part of the uh, paradigm, part of the scheme, part of the strategy that the United States government uses to shut you down uh, and uh, turn people away from you. So always keep that in mind. If somebody's being attacked and, and uh, taken off the air constantly, as we are at Revolution Radio, as we are at every interview that I conduct, we were taken off the air tonight. As soon as I started talking about the real history of World War II, we were taken off the air. Everything I was saying was simply for the sake of being recorded for posterity. Nothing was being broadcast tonight uh, with what I was saying earlier on Godlike Productions. Hopefully that doesn't happen with us tonight, but it gives you a sense of the importance of what we're contending with. I mean, Was, was the is, audio recorded despite the broadcast? I believe so. I know that the people in the chat room could hear us, and I know that they were the only ones who could hear us. All we had were the people in the chat room who could hear us. Everyone else, we were off the air. They, okay. they took it down. And so it was uh, because of what I was saying was uh, so radical. And they had an agent in place. They had uh, some dude uh, from River City who was some kind of cowboy who was basically – consistently just talking and talking and talking trying to drown me out which of course the dialogue you don't invite a guest on to do that that's obviously a government chill just the way these things work and there were some rumors of the uh, godlike productions being uh, some of a co-intel co pro-op obviously phenomenon and a lot of the magnificent staff who work with them are not like that at all but like all uh, people trying to get out the truth they get infiltrated and infested with co-intel pro agents uh, like that dude from River City who uh, – Kingman or whatever, some of these other people who were basically just try, con trying to constantly monologue underneath what I was saying and muting me out so that I could not be heard. So they had sabotage from the inside, believe me, and we know exactly who it is. That Kingman dude from uh, River City, or if I'm getting his name wrong, the cowboy from River City who claimed some of the questions were from Kingman, whatever. It's over now. People will hear it, and you'll get the picture of what I'm saying. We'll move on to very important immediate stuff, one of them being the Super Soldier Summit. Website was sabotaged. We think we have it uh, functioning now to the point where people can access it. Do order tickets if you cannot. Play for uh, pay a much lower price for the skyping or whatever they call it. There is a technique that Carrie Lynn Cassidy uses to broadcast worldwide on the internet what her convention Awake and Aware was showing, and uh, you could tell us perhaps what that technology would be. I'm too tech tardy and cyberphobic to even, you know, comprehend what that might be. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, when they have a convention and they uh, live stream it. You know, live streaming, uh, I guess it's called. And uh, so people can pay far less for the live stream than they would for a ticket. But, of course, it's not the same as personally meeting Ed Opperman, the private investigator for multiple celebrities, including Howard Stern and a number of other uh, very large names uh, that, um, such as that, that he wound up contending with, such as that. Who is that woman who ran for president that nobody remembers anymore? Drill, baby, drill. See, you want me to say her name? I do remember it. Oh, please, please. <laughs> Sarah Palin. Yeah. Sarah Palin, yes, he worked in a case that involved her as one of the investigative subjects where his client wound up being uh, very afraid for her life, and Sarah Palin lost her bid to run for the presidency. That's how important some of his cases have been. He lives in uh, right outside of Las Vegas. He'll be coming down to Henderson, Nevada, where the Super Soldier Summit has taken place to speak with us, along with Dr. Richard Allen Miller, who was the, um, the consultant to the X-Files. 
uh, because he had worked with the United States government for a number of years. Any number of people. You just look at the lineup. You'll see who's there. And uh, I think it's a, a fabulous lineup. They're worth meeting personally if you can't afford it. Believe me, no one understands more than any of us. And, you know, see if you can pay for the live stream, and that will help maintain and pay for the conference itself. In terms of Sarah Palin, the thing that I do remember is the woman who portrayed her in a pornographic film uh, called Nail and Palin is Lisa Ann, a pornographic adult actress who deserves a lot more credit. She's been a long time I, athletic I build. I think when Eminem made his music video, like around 2008 or so, I think he had her in the music video to portray Sarah Palin in the way that Eminem likes to mock and parody pop culture icons. And Eminem very much went to war against the machine, and it led to a lot of the uh, issues that he has had in the last couple of years. Wow. I mean, you would be familiar with that. You're very familiar with the music industry, and I appreciate that. Uh, it's good to see that Lisa and I wish... Sarah Palin's career had lasted only for the sake of providing Lisa Ann a bit more money as a Sarah Palin uh, double. <laughs> so that would have been funny, at least. But at any rate, uh, what we are discussing tonight, aside from the Super Soldier Summit, one final plug for that uh, for now, uh, the website, supersoldiersummit.com. Go over there and uh, check it out, and you'll help us all immensely just by investigating it. We are blending it only tangentially into what we're speaking of because super soldiery is really a study of super victimization. And the correct name for the super soldiers would be, in my opinion, super victims. And these are not bigger, badder uh, super soldiers. That would be more in keeping with something that has been popularized through very bad films made by Jean-Claude Van Damme and uh, Dolph Lundgren, two of our favorite people who are just learning to speak English. Uh, they uh, got together and uh, they did a lot of uh, very um, northern European grunting uh, through Universal Soldier. And um, programs like that are more what people uh, – what comes to mind when people think Super Soldier. That's not what it's about. Super Soldier is usually child prostitutes. Uh, Cume assassins who are broken in mind, body, and spirit and directed towards targets to compromise them. And that is how the United States military junta continues to fund itself because uh, no matter what happens, statistically, on any given year, they are less than 1% of the population, uh, literally, counting the entire Department of Defense, counting the U.S. Navy, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, the Reserves, all the branches of service put together is two and a half million people, and that's being cut down through sequestration to far less, and they're already at two and a half million people, less than one percent of the population, and they're going to get even smaller. They're a very cultic community by nature of being so small, and this community at less than one percent gets on any given year statistically well over 50 percent of the fiscal discretionary uh, income budgeted to it. So how does this keep happening? Be through the super soldier program. The politicians who continually lobby in Congress for them to continually get this astronomical funding basically is done through the compromise of the politicians through these child prostitute, cum assassin threats of blackmail slash uh, death. And uh, in the meantime, we will hopefully cover um, through Super Soldier Summit, which was originally very successful because it was more of a therapy session than it was, and a rehabilitation opportunity than it was a convention. It was not open to outsiders. It was very few people were allowed to come who were not part of the rehabilitation community, uh, psychiatric and counseling, and the super soldiers themselves, and a few interested outside observers were allowed. No journalists even volunteered to show up, we, even though they were welcome. And in terms of uh, what we're doing now is we are opening it to the public, and uh, so do take advantage of this. Let's make it happen. And in the meantime, Mr. Travesty wanted to talk a bit about militant survivalism, how we would handle certain situations that the government itself is obviously expecting as inevitable. And I'd like him to introduce us into that and kind of lead me by the nose because after the drop-dead argument I was through, uh, you know, I've still got flesh in my teeth that I yeah. need to pick out. Well, let's segue it nice and organically. Super soldiers, how big of a threat would it be to 
a community that has taken up a choice to do everything it felt was good as anybody could do to make a fortified community for a small group of people that wanted to live together, wanted to be a militia, and they were constantly on the worry of, we'll say they're renegade super soldiers that may be working for maybe, like, I don't know, like the Zeta cartels are running. You're down in, like, maybe Arizona, and America's falling apart, and the Zeta cartels are running Arizona, but Arizona's still your home, and there's still good things there, so you have chosen to do something in that kind of a, a, a territory, and one of these super soldier guys, because it's the only life he's known, decides to be a gun for hire to go and attack you for your things and your stuff and your life. Well, thank you for asking that, and uh, I, th I certainly think it's important to address the concept. Again, just to clarify this, uh, and it's very important, is the super soldiers would not be the ones to do that. It, the very reason they use misnomers like that are to misdirect our very conceptualization of what the government uses, what it has planned. The Third Reich, when it was in the midst of the Second World War, used contraindicative code names, and one of those contraindicative code names for the largest tank ever built, which was not the King Tiger tank. It was actually a far larger tank than that, only used on the Eastern Front. The Americans never even got to see an example of it was codenamed Maus, M-A-U-S, the German word for mouse, whereas the small robotically controlled drone vehicle, uh, it was a remotely controlled, excuse me, but essentially a non-autonomous robot, in other words, uh, it was controlled by radio remote, developed by the Third Reich, was able to roll under tanks, it was so small, and roll into various uh, structures. They also had helicopters, which were basically something most people don't recognize. Uh, the helicopters in the Third Reich were considered to be for anti-partisan warfare and also for the transport of the elite out of uh, various hotspot areas. But in terms of the use of helicopters, most people don't even know that both the Third Reich and the Japanese had helicopters in World War II, whereas the United States did not. And the Japanese were using them for anti-submarine warfare. Uh, again, something most Americans are entirely unaware of. The mm. point is that the remote-controlled vehicle, the small uh, unit, was called Goliath, which, of course, gives people the image of something very large. So it's the same with the super soldiers. What you have an idea of is basically not a super soldier who is essentially a child prophet prostitute who is insinuated into someone's estate, uh, what you are speaking of is like a commando or a uh, special forces uh, right, right. That, soldier. That, you know, major. the one-man army, like the movie Commando, where you can expect this one guy, this Arnold Schwarzenegger and kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, keep in mind that we need to put this into perspective. And I think people who have listened to me before have heard what I've said about various aspects of military operations, such as Mac V. Sog. That was, uh, I believe it was Military Assistance Command uh, Vietnam uh, Special Operations Group uh, was what that acronym uh, stood for. And the MACV saw got given credit for basically being uh, one of the ultimate killing machines. It basically probably is responsible for the deaths of more enemies than any other uh, enemy combatants, than any other unit in the United States military history. And what they were contending with was, of course, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Each one of them, at times their unit, which was always very small, there were never more than, uh, at the absolute maximum, 300 that were in country Vietnam, and that's stretching it. But at any given time, there were around 100 to 200 of these men in country. They sometimes suffered 100% fatality rates. Uh, but statistically, they killed about 150 enemy combatants per every one of them that died. Now, also, statistically, South Vietnamese, meaning Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the Nationalist Vietnamese, and the Americans who were assisting the Republic of Vietnam, American soldiers in Vietnam, just regular troops, these troops statistically killed three combatants to every one of them that died. So you have remarkable killing statistics uh, for the killing effectiveness of the American war machine, uh, whether it is elite or whether it is conventional. But now, the by the way, point, you said it was the Mac V SOG. Is that correct? That is correct. M A C uh, V, and then a dash, and then S O G. Military oh. Assistance Command, 
Vietnam Special Operations Group. It was oh, okay. a multi-service organization, meaning it consisted of sailors, such as Navy SEALs, consisted of uh, airmen, uh, a few for security, plus, of course, Army and Marine Corps. So it was it, Joe, effectively. Essentially, yes. It was yeah. like that in that it was a multi-service uh, organization and uh, was a very successful experiment in a very real sense. But it's important to remember not to discredit them or the regular servicemen. These high killing ratios on everyone's side – by the way, the machine gun – was responsible for the deaths of more enemy combatants in the Vietnam War than any other weapon. And in most wars, machine guns are responsible for killing uh, far more of enemy combatants of any nation, uh, meaning that any nation using machine guns, the machine guns will kill more enemy combatants than any of your soldiers' rifles will statistically. Rifles are basically for self-defense. Uh, they're not really an offensive weapon. Machine guns are what take out people in groups. They're, they're what are basically your weapon of war. Uh, your unit is built around the machine gun unit. So uh, to um, finalize what I'm saying about the one-man army, the MACV SOG was the closest we came to that. But the reason that both the conventional troops, uh, the regulars, and the elite achieved such high killing ratios was air support. Now, in Vietnam, what happened with the American regulars was constantly they would get into hot zones and they would call in air support, airstrikes. And if it's really bad, like you see in the film Platoon, you see the uh, lieutenant, I believe, who calls in an airstrike on his own unit because at that point his unit is thoroughly combined in combat, locked in bayonet-level struggle with the uh, Vietnamese. So at that point he calls in an airstrike on his own unit. So that uh, could happen, and the same thing happened with Mac V. Slug. The primary purpose – was to be in theater on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, find enemy concentrations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and call in airstrikes. Mm. So even though every one of these men was very capable of hand-to-hand -hand level combat, personal combat, keep in mind that these enormous fatality ratios, the massive difference between those of the Vietnamese and the Americans, primarily is due to air power. So the idea of the one-man army, the Rambo, the Schwarzenegger, who's coming in someplace and taking on everybody, okay, that is fantasy. It is not that there are not outstanding soldiers out there who are capable of acting as one-man armies. Uh, the, probably the most exemplary of them in American history uh, might well be Audie Murphy. Or he's certainly up there. And Audie Murphy was able to do on a unit level what uh, ancient heroes are recorded to have done on the level of an army. Basically, he would take on units of armor and leap from tank to tank, dropping in grenades. Uh, this ultimately earned him you know, the Congressional Medal of Honor and a lifetime of suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which at that point in history, unfortunately, was never diagnosed and obviously took uh, a lot out of him through alcoholism and antisocial behavior and ultimately his death in an airplane as a civilian. But in terms of what happened with your, uh, shall we say, community example, you really don't need to worry about the one-man army coming in, taking people out. You need to worry about somebody coming in marking your region and calling in an airstrike. <laughs> That's what you need to be worried now, about. That's now, the... like, yeah, like, you know, my imagination is is that they, they have the laser-guided missile system, but that takes satellite synchronicity. Right, it basically, it's a major resource pool, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's not going to exist. I mean, to give you an example, Operation Desert Storm, which I was a part of, pretty much stopped dead when Saddam Hussein had the conducted the brilliant maneuver militarily. Uh, it was an ecocidal act. It was, in other words, an act of ecological genocide. But what he, when he set all of those uh, well over half a thousand oil wells on fire, when he retreated from Kuwait, what happened was the entire offensive into his nation stopped stone cold dead. It turned from a blitzkrieg into a blitz freeze. Mm. Uh, because when he did that, he created so much of a cloud, a toxic cloud of particulate matter that was so thick in the air that it basically not only led to the death of all kinds of animals and people, but also blocked, literally blocked, the sky from the ground. And we went from geosynchronous satellite positioning and coordination of artillery and airstrikes to compasses and grease pencils inside of lap maps. Uh, and we, uh, it froze the entire operation, and that bought him another 10 to 20 years in power. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, by something very similar is obviously going to happen in any societal breakdown, simply because, not because of necessarily a smokescreen like that, basically, literally blocking off satellite communications with your navigational systems on which all of your electronically based air attacks are based. You don't have pilots anymore that can bomb by sight. Literally, you do not, because they're going so fast, they're going so high. They can't see jack crap on the ground. Pilots are only working electronically. All of the strikes they conduct, that's why we developed the drones. The drones are camera eyes that are basically virtualized for men playing cast, uh, you know, uh, canasta or uh, arcade back in the uh, control room, which is back in Las Vegas. What would you need, within reason, being in this survival defense system, you know, that you're going to have to plan out? We're talking about really planning it and doing it well and knowing what you need. What would you need to take that thing out or hinder its ability to do its job? Well, my impression is that uh, drones are shot down fairly regularly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and they're taken out, of course, with uh, basically laser-guided rockets that uh, I don't know who is supplying them now, but they're probably purchased on the black market through military dealers that are uh, basically somehow stealing them from the United States. I don't know if there's that many other countries that produce them. But uh, the idea of taking out a drone with a rocket-propelled grenade, like the Vietnamese were constantly taking down helicopters with rocket-propelled grenades, that is, uh, I don't believe, going to be uh, possible. You can take it down. It's possible. You can take it down, but it's going to be more luck and accident than actual aiming. I, I don't think that you're going to need to worry about that, though. It's a legitimate question when society is functioning, because then you've got a situation where I honestly wonder why they didn't take out Bill Dorner with a drone. But Christopher Dorner, excuse me. But they took out uh, Christopher Dorner by burning him alive, like they burned everybody at Waco, and uh, we're trying to do so. They, they did authorize drones to search for him, which makes him the first American citizen on U.S. soil to date to be publicly, officially targeted for drone surveillance. And the survivor of the Boston Massacre is the second person in the public knowledge that has been also targeted in this fashion. Right. By the way, it is important to bring up to our listenership that 7-Eleven has officially made the statement and taken the stance that those gentlemen who they claim were responsible for the Boston massacre, the Boston bombing, did not rob 7-Eleven. I don't know if you're aware of that. So, oh, well, uh, I, I, I didn't know they were accused of robbing a 7-Eleven. As far as oh, I'm concerned, they're patsies. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Well, it's a healthy attitude to have, and I can understand exactly why you go through But the narrative, the running narrative was that they had conducted the bombing and then left the scene and robbed a 7-Eleven to get money uh, while they were trying to make it out of area. So it was a damning. Uh, looking uh, story, of course, it was entirely contrived. So um, all credit to 7-Eleven, there goes an industry for you that are not bastards who came out and stood up against the government and said those men have not robbed the 7-Eleven. So that is a very interesting uh, um, situation. It shows how our society is deconstructing and devolving. Then no matter how many drones and planes that they've got, what you really need to worry about far more than that are typical rogues and villains as opposed to to drone strikes because if we get to that point of societal collapse, the drones are not going to be a factor. All of these machines, of course, in the Terminator scenario, you have a very specific scenario where you've got an artificial intelligence manipulated mass production facility or a series thereof that are continuing to churn out via the artificial intelligence manipulation and administration further and further Terminator drones. Mm-hmm. Now, and this, this provides it with an army based on resources that's amassing through other robotics uh, to put to its automated assembly line. So you have a uh, von Neumann machine, a, uh, a perpetual motion machine. You have basically a war machine set on autopilot that in the Terminator scenario. Okay, reality in the United States, that's never going to happen. There are people that believe that DARPA and other industries are involved in effectively making it come true. And a lot of people understand that James Cameron, who takes credit for the vision of the Terminator universe, 
is like Steven Spielberg, a tipped off insider in the Hollywood system. And in fact, he has made the suspicious move of, uh, of moving to Australia as his effective home and general place of filming, which makes people wonder why is he abandoning the United States. And so basically they are saying that there might actually be... Well, he may already have, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that I think that the scenario presented by uh, Call of Duty Black Ops in that uh, particular shoot 'em up video game where they're showing basically something very similar, and uh, you have airborne drones, seaborne drones, landborne drones, and basically a entire robotic army that uh, is meant for an automated battlefield without American troops, and what they don't tell you is the rationalization behind that, which is, of course, nobody, uh, obviously, what I just told the military is less than one percent of the u.s population it's going to get even smaller uh nobody's joining the military and with very good reason and i hope that i'm a major factor in that decruiting process and uh ultimately what the americans are saying is we we just can't afford the manpower we have no manpower to enforce either police state on uh, foreign or domestic lands. So let's go into uh, basically investing more and more into higher technology, automated killing machines, and take it from there. Of course, in Call of Duty, Black Ops, the uh, automated assembly line version, <laughs> everything goes haywire. The enemy gets the keys in terms of codes and uh, basically turns all of the machines against the American public. And Precisely. It's up to to you as a first-person shooter to start uh, wrecking machinery. Well, all of that uh, is indeed possible. Nothing's impossible. The DOMS, the deep underground military bases, conceivably could be equipped with automated assembly line plants that are basically run by artificial intelligences. And if everybody dies, then those things underground can just keep churning things out. Now, I don't feel that's going to happen. The reason why is I personally knew somebody who was a brilliant antisocial geek, nerd, gamer. Uh, this dude, basically, if it weren't for the fact that he inherited a home in the middle of a combat zone in uh, Ohio, it, he basically would be homeless right now. He's one of the most overeducated people that I know. And the term overeducated does apply. You can be overeducated just like you can be overgunned. You give a 44 Magnum to a woman who's five feet tall, and if she fires that gun, she's just going to break her nose, create hairline fractures in her face with a recoil because it'll bounce right out of her hand. It's going to leave a blood pattern of those neural grooves from the handle in uh, just basically imprinted into the palms of her hands. Uh, I'm not exaggerating that you can be overgunned. That's not going to help anybody. And that'll leave you open and vulnerable to whoever's coming after you. It's the same thing with education. You can be overeducated. There is such a thing as too much information or too much of a good thing. And in the case of this individual, his education was in information systems technology, specializing in artificial intelligence. And he was also an electronics engineer. Now, to again, to put this into perspective for you, engineering has a set of ranks where they believe that the stupidest or the dumbest engineers are civil engineers. Then the next ones up on the respect list are essential like uh, chemical engineers, and then the ones up at the top of the list are like electronics engineers. And so the, he was at the top of the top in terms of the electronic engineering combined with his artificial intelligence knowledge. What did he use it for? He combined it into a double major and a degree specializing in artificial intelligence manipulated automated assembly systems. So he couldn't get a job to save his soul this guy basically went to NASA, and they said, look, clown, we're just a welfare state for engineers. We're just a permanent employment program for all the old boys' network of engineers that existed years ago. We don't do anything. Are you crazy? Did, did he, did he try to go work for the quote-unquote shadow government? Did he, like, walk well, in the this stump is the works? Point. You, see, well, this is the point, Mr. Travesty. No one tries to work for the government. It's like somebody says, I want to join Delta Force. Or somebody says, I want to be a ranger. Now, unless things have changed radically for decades, nobody said, I want to be a ranger. Or, or you could say that, but nobody, like, there was no recruiting offices for them. Like, hey, I, want, I don't want to go through the regular military. Well, I want to go straight. Well, right, you have to be the best of the best of the best kind of thing. Then they drag you into the rangers. Then they drag you into special forces. Right, See, That's right. the way it worked for decades. Now, things well, I, I thought that in the science community, it was different. Like, if you could prove... 
that you had this application, you had a chance. Oh, because... yeah, then they come for you. That's my point. No one ever came for this SOB. This poor guy was going everywhere. He was, make, he was passing out his, uh, his resume everywhere. He went to agribusiness. He, first he went to NASA, like I said. They turned him down because they're nothing other than a permanent employment program for technicians, old ones at that. And when they all retire, NASA disappears. End of story. Then he went over to industry and said, how about automated assembly lines for the cars? We don't need uh, uh, any employees at all. That was a big fear throughout the 70s was, oh, automation is going to get your job. And they just laughed at him and said, dude, we're not even producing cars anymore. The Japanese and the Germans produce you know, double on the part of the Germans than us, uh, quadruple on the part of the Japanese than us. We're going out of business, you know, and we're just turning ourselves over to the government, and we're going to get on corporate welfare, and they'll have to pay us just to keep some people employed so all these people don't become homeless. It's just a welfare state for corporocracy and mm. for uh, the people working. Get out of here. And then he went to agribusiness. And he said, oh, hey, I can uh, you know, do all this automated picking machines and harvesting machines, and we can turn it into an assembly line operation. You don't need illegal immigrants. It'll be hygienic. It'll be you know, whatever. And the reason I say that is because illegal immigrants are notorious. Here in the state of California, the overwhelming majority of food in the world comes, a good deal of it, from the state of California. And the state of California is also notorious for the majority of Cholera cases and various food infections that come to the rest of the United States from lettuce and salads that are shipped out of California. This mm. is because the illegal immigrants are kept in housing and they are not given outhouses or johns. They literally relieve themselves fecally and in terms of urine in the field. Yes. And they use those vegetables to wipe themselves. And oh. they bring their babies with them. They bring their babies with them and they wipe their babies' butts with the spinach because it's got the most grip on it for fecal matter. And they just throw that in with everything else. All that spreads the cholera and everybody comes down with it multiple times a year and people die. Nobody reports it because the entire industry is based on the illegal immigrants. Now, he was thinking he could eliminate all this. And they said, go to hell. That's our version of fertilizer. We get human fertilizer now from all those people oh, out yeah. there. The point that I'm making with agribusiness at that time was that he, they just basically said it'll be cheaper to have illegal immigrants working in the field. Literally, you know what they eat? He said, no, what do they eat? He said, they eat what we grow. They just eat it in the field. That's what they're fed. You know, this is cheaper than anything you're proposing. And he went to other industries, and they told him, go to hell because we're sending all of what we build down south. Yeah, so my point is that's never going to happen. Because if the government were doing that with deep underground military bases, they would have dragged him in. He would have disappeared into a black op. I never would have seen him again. He's spending the rest of his life at home, unemployable, playing video games. So there you have it. All <laughs> the right. government didn't take him down there into a deep underground military bunker. So as far as I'm concerned, there's none down there because it doesn't matter how many geniuses they had working out before. They always need new blood if you've got an ongoing project. You know what I mean. You always need new blood if you've got an ongoing project to improve, to innovate, to keep something moving. They don't have any of that. So what you need to work with is the threat of something like the zombie apocalypse. Far more possible, far more potential, because government was working on that for years and for very specific reasons. Oh. Uh, and as we go into the second hour, a lot of what we talk about should be devoted to that because of here goes something that they are purposefully – getting you into the meme of right. the memetic. Do they have the biological mix perfected yet where they could start people turning into zombies, or are the zombies that we think of entirely just metaphors for some other condition altogether, which would end up being the masses coming at you? Well, uh, the masses coming at you is ultimately what may very well result from experiments that have been conducted throughout centuries. Now, for centuries, there existed zombie and zombieism. And zombie, by the way, is both a singular and a plural. Like the Japanese word kamikaze, there's no such thing as kamikazes. It's either a singular or a plurality, just like the term zombie in the Haitian Creole. Okay. And the Haitian Creole, uh, it, the zombie is Z-O-M-B-I. Now, when you add the Z-O-M-B-I-E onto it, that is a modern neologism. And the neologism was developed for a feral zombie, a zombie being Z-O-M-B-I. Now, zombie meant person without volition, person without will, somebody being used for labor to work the cane fields in Haiti, Haiti and other places throughout Pan America. Now, that is a zombie when it becomes feral, when it starts attacking anything and anyone like a shark smell in blood. Then you add the E on the end, and it's called a zombie. 
Then you I can put see. the S on the end for plurals. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, okay. that's a neologism. Now, how did we wind up developing this neologism? Now, none of that makes any sense. Uh, well, it got developed because of actual incidents Now, uh, and what people found out. Now, the uh, Valjo Houdouans, uh, Poudre, the zombie Poudre, are uh, the voodoo powder. The components were the topic of much speculation, and it was a U.S. government doctor who was sent down to investigate it originally, well before Edmund Wade Davis, who is famous for writing the book The Serpent and the Rainbow, and actually wrote a academic textbook, much more informative, much more pertinent, titled The Ethnobiology of the Haitian Zombie, Now, uh, which very few people know about. Uh, Serpent and the Rainbow is basically uh, uh, a novelization of his experience. The ethnobotany of the Haitian Zombie is the science. Mm. And very technical, very difficult to read, Fairly so, inaccessible here's, to the lay public. I'm here's sorry? the important question. Uh, when it pertains to defensibleness, the zombies that they are, is there a film or series like Walking Dead or whatever that would be the most accurate just to the behavior, to what to expect? Are you defending yourself against slow-moving masses? Is it going to be like this movie World War Z coming out where they're just charging at you like a stampeding thing that can stack on top of each other? Or is it like going to be like Resident Evil where they're sort of like bio-mutants? What scenarios are people going to have to think about if they deploy this madness upon the masses? Well, the reason all of those variants are being proposed is because all of those variants are possible. You're going to well, get a combination thereof. Now, the uh, bio-mutants is a bit far-fetched, but it's certainly possible. But it would take a series of incredibly fortuitous or uh, unlucky, uh, as opposed to fortuitous, but highly uh, unusual circumstances to lead to the point where Monsanto slash Umbrella Corporation <laughs> is unleashing, is unleashing uh, the uh, bio zombies. Now, what would instead be a danger would be the Terminator seed, which, of course, would uh, conceivably, this is always a potential, eliminate all normal organic growth and replace it with vegetation that is self-programmed to auto-destruct and die off, which creates a universal famine. And that leads to cannibalism right then and there. So that is a potential uh, that they're also trying to acclimate us to through all of these films. Also, a, another um, example of a potential, I don't believe this is going to happen, uh, of Monsanto going wrong. Uh, slash umbrella would be The Last of Us, which is a new video game about the fungus that grows out of people, because fungus does grow on people, and fungus has been an enemy of armies for many years. There is an actual textbook, an actual academic textbook written prior to the Second World War, I believe it was published between World War I and World War II, called Man Against the Fungi. And this is not a novel, it's not science fiction. It was one of the reasons why H.G. Wells made the Martians of his invasion. He portrayed them as fungus. And, uh, but uh, Man Against the Fungi is an actual medical textbook which talks about the effect of fungus on armies and how it can impede them and their progress. So in terms of what we had with the zombie or the Z-O-M-B-I, what happened was there was a prominent psychopharmacologist, the only two-time winner of the Albert Lasker Award for Clinical Medical Research, an award known as America's Nobel Prize, who had, with Manfred Kleins, co-coined the term cyborg back in 1960. And they first used the phrase in an article published in Astronautics Magazine about the advantages of self-regulating humanic machine systems in outer space. Now, he wound up working in Haiti, or Haiti. Haiti is simply the Haitian Creole for land of mountains, for 30 years, uh, assuming a central role in establishing Le Centre de Psychologie et Neurologie Mars Klein, the Mars Klein Center of Psychology and Neurology. Now, uh, when we get back from break time, I'm going to rush to the bathroom, by the way. <laughs> when we get back, we'll continue with what can happen from that. So we've been talking about aspects of militia preparedness, primarily putting things into perspective with our fears about what kind of technology can be used against us when in the hands of less than life-favoring individuals, shall we say. There was another incredible possibility, which is Project Bluebeam. So, Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit about the whole Project Bluebeam angle that somebody that would want to be in a militia is going to have to worry about? 
Well, the Project Blue Beam angle is, of course, a disinformation campaign. We have disinformation uh, government shills who I have identified and outed, who I am not going to name. Uh, there's no point in going into it right now. All people need to do is go to the Conspiracy Con, where I was one of the speakers, and they can look at the speaker's panel. You can purchase that on DVD. That's the responsibility of Brian William Hall, who uh, basically has a handle on those DVDs. He's not releasing them to the Internet or uploading them. That's not to say someone who purchases the, to those DVDs will not ultimately do so. But uh, as far as I know, none of them are up there. But you can see the speaker's panel where uh, I am outing someone who is frontally attacking me, who happens to be one of those chills. Now, he wrote a book called AD, or After Disclosure. That alone says it all. You are being primed and prepped for a so-called disclosure of a a very, shall we say, um, kind of falsified government alien invasion. The reality is that the ufological experience is quite real. It's been parallel to the human existence for as long as recorded history and before. But the idea of that ufological uh, experience suddenly turning hostile and nasty, I'm not saying that the universe is full of love and light. It's a very violent universe. We can see that through the physics of it. But the reality is the U.S. government fed everything it could about uh, DNA and various aspects of the Drake equation everything that they could into analyzing the universe around us and they came to the conclusion that doesn't mean it's right or wrong but they came to the conclusion there is no alien life there is no one in this universe other than us that the visits much of what we are experiencing in terms of abductions that uh, those that are not my lab they feel are basically people from the future who are our descendants who populate that universe and at that point have evolved so differently so radically to so many different environments as well as genetically created so many different drones of various animal compositions in terms of genetics to work in zero gravity environments heavy gravity environments etc that it looks like any number of different alien races but as for now Everything we see in terms of conventional light, conventional radio, all the full electromagnetic spectrum going back to as far as we can, all we can do is see the past. Everything we see from Alpha Centauri, our nearest neighbor, is four years ago. Everything we see into the past, it's empty. There is nothing. It is total silence, dead silence, empty silence. There is nothing out there that is producing anything on the level that we've interpreted as uh, communications. That's the basis for their logic. And one can argue, oh, it's some exotic uh, wave. Well, you know, that's physically, literally physically impossible. There's nothing out there in the physical realm that we see. Gravity, uh, anything along the electromagnetic spectrum, nothing is coming out in a pattern sense of communication. So if anyone, for instance, our own Earth, uh, basically, the year Emperor Hirohito was born, uh, who is a predominant figure of the Second World War, was 1901, and that is when uh, Marconi sent out that little letter S with a radio transmission into space, basically, by simply by making that radio transmission. That little letter S, like in the movie Contact, is at the edge of a shell of radio waves that now covers the equivalent of 90,000 light years because radio waves go at the speed of light. And our entire little planet is now, in terms of radiographic spectrometry, uh, something like millions of times brighter than our sun. So if there were anyone in the universe just playing a radio, and think about this, think about what I'm saying. Our, our most powerful planetary exploration radars are already 10 billion times brighter than the sun in radiography. So to external observers, our planet has erupted like a radio volcano. We outshine the sun in the radio portion of the spectrum. And um, basically, as I said, because they go at the speed of light, these waves have encompassed a sphere of 9,000 stars. So if anyone were out in the universe, we'd see it. It'd be like somebody playing a boombox who lived next door. And there's no way you could hide it. Your biggest problem would be trying to filter out those alien transmissions so you could hear your radio program with Steve Travesty. <laughs> so none of that is out there. So whatever invasion they have is going to be fake. So you'll be dealing with human technology, 
technology you can comprehend, then that's technology you can take on. And anybody who tells you disclosure is coming is working for the government and on their side and trying to promote a falsehood to delude you into it's aliens and they're too much for us to handle. You'd better surrender. You'd better give up. They just, they've just they got millions of years on us in evolution. It's all a lie. So what I was saying about the zombies, now that's a totally different reason that is based in real science and has turned into something that they're worried will develop into a plague. What we are dealing with was, as I said, we had the man who developed a psychology in Haiti and established its only psychiatric institute, as a matter of fact. There's only one in the entire Haiti nation in the capital, and this individual was a uh, psychopharmacologist, and he was working with cybernetics for space travel. And uh, the individual's name again, Dr. Nathan S. Klein. And as a psychopharmacologist, he was somebody who basically was trying to find a way to put men into a death-like coma as astronauts so that they could travel all the way out to the end of the solar system, Pluto, which would take decades and decades, if not hundreds of years, and come out of it alive. They wouldn't need to eat or sleep or defecate or expel gases. They would be, for all intents and purposes, dead, reanimated at the other end, and then uh, get dead again, come back home. So he was planning on such projects back when we had a serious space program. That's why he was 30 years down in Haiti studying zombism. And that's why he called down Edmund Wade Davis and, uh, to buy the zombie powder for him to work with and analyze pharmacologically because it's illegal in Haiti. Since zombies are real, it is illegal to manufacture them. And as a result, he hired Edmund Wade Davis to be a criminal. And that man, against all of Aiti's laws, purchased zombie powder in the same manner that you and I would buy crack from a crack dealer and ultimately smuggled it out of Aiti to pharmaceutical industries so that they could synthesize it. And so what he conducted was drug smuggling. Now, biological researchers have since created dead zombie cells in the lab which outperform living cells. Seriously. And this is at Sandia National Laboratories. And the whole purpose was the University of New Mexico, by the way, was cooperating with this. Uh, so we're talking about all Roswell territory. They innovated a technique whereby mammalian cells are coated with silica to form near-perfect replicas. And the silica replicants can survive greater pressures and temperatures than human flesh. And they perform many of the functions better than the original cells did when they were alive. So by painting the cells with silica, acid in a petri dish. The acid embalms the organic matter in the cell down to the nanomatter level, down to the nanometer. And the silica then acts as a permeable armor. Now, this is according to Michael Hess at the American Office of Public Affairs. I'm getting that you've got like this interesting kind of bio armor. It's basically like an undead second skin that you're putting on. Now, is this yes. going to, uh, as far as it relates to the quote-unquote zombie apocalypse, is that something that would become administratively something that turns you into a zombie? Is that like a side effect of wearing it? Well, uh, it tends to work when the cell is already dead and then reanimates the cell. That is one way that it is interpreted as a function. That means the cell beneath can be used as a catalyst at far greater temperatures than normal because a living cell could not tolerate it. Heating the silica to around 400 degrees Celsius evaporates the protein in the cell, which kills it, but leaves the silica as a three-dimensional replica of the formerly living cell or the being which those cells compose. So the difference is that instead of modeling the face, say, of a famous criminal, the hardened silica-based cells display internal mineralized structures with intricate features ranging from nano to millimeter length scales. So this is considered an invaluable biological material that can thus be converted into a reusable fossil, which could be used in fuel cells, decontamination, sensor technology, as well as commercial manufacturing. Now, the lead researcher of the project, his name is Brian Kerr, K-A-E-H-R, and he said in a statement that research distinguishes between a mummy cell and a zombie cell in this project. Our zombie cells, this is the term he uses, bridge chemistry and biology to create forms that not only near perfectly resemble their past selves, 
but can do future work. So this is not automation that you need to worry about. Here's the connection. There was a poor young lady named Terry Schindler Schivo, who I know all of you might remember. Well, Terry Schindler Schivo's case was remarkably pertinent because she went into what was a aware, comatic, functioning coma. That means she was entirely aware of everything that was happening to her whenever her husband, who poisoned her, went in to the hospital where she was kept on life support and taunted her. And all the nurses would say after he left the room, her uh, stats would go through the sky, blood pressure way up. She'd be diaphragmatic, pale, in absolute terror because he went in there to constantly terrorize her. And the nurses insisted that she was very similar to Rom Hubin. There is a man whose name is R-O-M-H-O-U-B-E-N-S. And Rom Hubins was a fully functional victim of a car accident who was declared legally dead and in vegetative state, and it took a Dutch neuroscientist to use state-of-the-art imaging technology to prove his brain was fully functional and he understood everything that was going on around him in the hospital but could do nothing about it while all the doctors were telling his parents to pull the plug for 10 years. Mm. Now, because the parents kept him alive through that period of time, that neuro physicist was able to ultimately help him enter a stage of rehabilitation. Now, that could have happened with Terry Schindler Schiavo in the United States, but it went up to the governor of Florida, Jeb Bush, who could have given her a gubernatorial pardon and ordered something like that pursued, but he ordered her killed. Now, why? The reason why is because the Terry Schindler Schiavo case is a legal precedent for when your brain ceases to function as defined as a living human being the way we set the definition you are legally dead and have no rights and we can kill you now the reason that's so important is because she is the legal precedent for zombie labor uh. if they have every right to kill you they now have every right to use you as slave labor so now all of the Haitians that were, say, for instance, used by the U.S. government. i uh, give you an example. During the American Civil War, the United States government invaded and occupied an island off of Haiti, which belonged by the state constitution of Haiti to Haiti itself. This island, Navassa Island, basically was invaded by the U.S., and they brought hundreds of black slaves there because slavery was still legal until 1865. They worked them to death and beyond because they experimented with the zombie powder as applied by the Haitians on these black slaves. And ultimately, when they were done working with them, they locked them in the bowels of Navassa Island. And it is now off limits to anyone other than the U.S. Coast Guard and scientists who the Department of the Interior allows inside. And to make sure no one goes near it, they claimed it as part of the United States, even though... It's separated from the U.S. by Cuba, Jamaica, and Haiti. It is considered part of the United States. The Americans occupy it, and they put it under the Department of the Interior, which is responsible for coastal islands like Catalina Island off the state of California, as if it were right off our border. So the United States now technically and legally shares borders, maritime borders, with Haiti and Jamaica and Cuba. It's right south of Guantanamo Bay. And for 12 nautical miles stretching out from the coast of that island, the U.S. Coast Guard has orders to shoot to kill if you come near that island. And they'll probably escort you away, but if you were insistent, you were trying to break on that island, they do have the state-induced authority to kill you. So what's on that island? And we know what was on it. Hundreds of African-American slaves that were experimented on with the zombie powder and worked to death before the end of the American Civil War. Now, they, since they were dead anyway, might still be down there in the mines. That is the situation that we're dealing with now. Uh, are we talking about individuals that are effectively brain dead and yet they still can perform basic motor functions? Well, um, let me give you an example. Uh, Jean Wilbrun William Sam. He was the Haitian prime minister, uh, or he was the minister of war originally. Then he became Haiti's president. 
he was going to invade Navassa Island and take it back. And basically, he was attacked by a crowd of people in his offices. And uh, this crowd of people was like animals. They were feral. They were beyond control. They were shot multiple times. They wouldn't go down. They dragged him out of his offices and tore him apart limb from limb and ate him. Okay. And that was how he died. Okay. Yeah, that was when he died on uh, basically um, July 1915. Mm. Well, so, were these, uh, did these guys move fast or slow? These guys were fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So the whole point is that what the Americans have now, based on the Terry Schindler Shivo case, is legal precedent. If your brain doesn't go functioning, and you're basically rendered as fairly immortal uh, and can survive high temperatures through the silica of the zombie cells that they created, they've got a labor force that can withstand working in extreme high temperatures like the middle of nuclear furnaces and power plants. Hmm. And because these people are dead, they don't need to eat, and they have no rights because Terry Schindler Schiavo had no rights. Hmm. They can kill you anytime they want. So they can work you anytime they want. So you're a fully functioning brain trapped in this body, and you're being used as slave labor. You've lost your will. You've lost your volition. And eventually the U.S. government can work you until they want and then kill you if they want. And you have no rights based on the laws of the United States because of the Terry schindler Shivo precedent. You are dead. You are legally non-existent. None of the rights, none of the laws apply to you. You are a slave. So that brings back legal slavery to the United States. Now, why do they want to do this? Because they are convinced, based on the kind of ecological and environmental advice from their advisors, they are convinced by people like Dr. Peter Ward that we are going to have a monumental disaster that is going to render the world fairly deoxygenated. Basically, what happened is um, we have a situation where five times in the past, there's been 500,000 years of ice cycles, and the ice layers display oxygen and carbon dioxide starved levels. Uh, none of these show iridium from asteroids or melted tectite, meaning that it wasn't bolides that was killing life on the planet. It was because the carbon dioxide levels have been much higher than now. The Permian extinction was the worst. 200 million years ago, 97% of all life and 90% of all species of the five big main extinctions uh, died off due to anoxic oceans. Anoxic means without oxygen. So, you know, basically, we have a situation where cyclically we have a situation where the oxygen on our planet disappears. So why is this happening? When they investigate this, they find out there's, there's volcanism in the oceans. And it's so important to emphasize the fact that the currents keep the oceans oxygenated, and all oceans have oxygen except the Black Sea. Uh, stagnation leads to anaerobic or non-oxygen breathing bacteria. And the anaerobic bacteria produces hydrosulfide, so toxic that they are the cause of the Permian and other mass extinctions. So the Ice Ages prevent this. So that's why we're trying to create an Ice Age with the chemtrails. In the meantime, if you remove the ice caps, then the anoxic oceans result, like the Black Sea, uh, in hydrosulfide bubbles that are produced by anaerobic bacteria that cause all the mass extinctions. Now, as a backup plan, they have created based on the fact that carbon dioxide coincident with mass extinction, no one dies from CO2, heavy CO2 produces anoxic oceans, and which is a habitat for zero oxygen photosynthetic bacteria. These produce hydrosulfite gas, which can kill animals at variable susceptibility levels, but the land plants got it first in the Permian, and that created a huge web, wedge, just a biomass of dead botanicals, which goes into the sea, then the oceans die off, because there's no more phosphate or nitrate runoff from the land. Mm. Then all you have is a cycle where basically you have entropic anoxic oceans. Now, here's an example. In 1986, you've got an entropic anoxic lake created as active volcanoes 
were going off within Lake Nyos, N-A-I-Y-O-S, in the Cameroon, in Africa. And uh, they pumped carbon dioxide into the water. They nurtured anaerobic bacteria, which doesn't need oxygen, cannot live with oxygen. That's why they blow the zombies' brains out is because that exposes the brains and the anoxic bacteria to oxygen instantly, and they all die. The warm water gets trapped as a cold gas at the bottom. Well, it all burst in a carbon dioxide bubble, and in Lake Nyos in the Cameroon in 1986, tens of thousands of cattle died, and 3,000 people died in a single night, 1,700 of them instantly, because all of that oxygen was sucked out of the sky. Now, that can happen on a global level. We have a giant version of Lake Niles in the Black Sea. And most of our oceans along the coast are becoming anoxic. So the uh, environmental scientists have convinced the elite we need to create an ice age to slow this down, and we need to create a race of the undead that don't need to breathe that can survive in a world without oxygen. That's sick. <laughs> in a word so would there literally be no oxygen or would it be a depleted oxygen like what are the typical survival odds if you're somebody like say our our station producer like nighthawk who like does farming and things like that and like how much prepping would it take to deal with that reality because let me tell you something you watch real prepper solutions on tv i don't think they're talking about a, prepping for an oxygenless society they're just talking about economy crash well hydrogen sulfide is created by microbes uh, which are a water molecule with sulfur in the middle that can dissolve oxygen uh, that Namibia was one of the worst uh, H2S uh, hydrogen sulfide hotspots hot in what's now called, it used to be called the Ivory Coast, the Gold Coast, all those romantic names for the uh, slave days. Now it's called the Skeleton Coast. And there's several skeleton coasts off uh, Africa and other places of the world that are now anaerobic. The uh, Congo is an area of oceanic concentration. And it's rich in the upwelling of big nutrients caused by sardine fish die-offs, uh, which have all depleted uh, from overfishing. Phytoplankton has suffered mass death resulting from the lack of fish food. And uh, it's visible from space as a hydrosulfide pool. So this is a calm world that we're heading towards, especially if the Gulf current dies due to the melting of the ice caps from, say, Greenland, or the melting of the ice caps, which is happening in the North Pole, that cuts down the current, which is known as the Gulf Stream, which warms Britain, which warms Europe, and uh, basically, uh, when you remove the ice caps, anoxic oceans result like the Black Sea area. And uh, then the hydrosulfide bubbles come up, and that big bubble... Uh, the global model of it that's been modeled uh, comes out of the Black Sea. It is basically, as what happened in the last several times that we've had these mass extinction events, those, uh, high, those bubbles are highly flammable. They float over continents. Lightning strikes them, and they set the continent on fire. If that one single giant methane bubble escapes from the bottom of the Black Sea, because it's kept down there at the bottom, because it sinks to the bottom, because of the temperature differential... When it rises due to stagnation, that could float over China, lightning strikes it, and you've just annihilated half a billion people. That's the kind of situation that we're speaking of as a regularity uh, that was every day for you know, millions of years in these mass extinction cycle events. That is why they're not even thinking of the human race surviving. They're thinking of creating a race of the undead to carry on the human. Right. Well, I mean, it's a race of the undead to support the the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Because at that point, it doesn't sound like you're going to even have room for, like, a quote-unquote aristocratic class. You're just going to have, like, the overseers, effectively. It's just like, we've been having this kind of industrial revolution, which has led to our techno technology age the way that we have, and it's been, for the most part, just the last hundred or so years. And it's kind of strange that we've had this explosion of tech at seemingly the last minute, it's suspicious to me that we've had this explosion of tech that seems to work out just great for them and just horrible for us. Well, I, I would recommend that, first off, you learn to accept the fact that everything I'm giving you is what they're planning for doesn't mean it's going to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's a good start. 
Well, uh, first off, the next mass extinction should not be here for 250 million years, but that's based on cosmological cycles of the orbit of our brown dwarf star, our dark binary star companion, which has been referred to as Nemesis. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, are you basing that on your government intel? What are you basing the you you telling us the acceptance of our second that, sun theory as valid? Yeah, that that is basically government intel. There's several things Great. that okay. the uh, that used to be common knowledge. By the way, it used to be common knowledge taught in school uh, when older people were growing up in the 1950s. Uh, used to be common knowledge that they pointed out the fact that the overwhelming majority of stars in the galaxy were binary stars. Uh, so the common uh, evolution of stars is to create binary star companions. Mm. Uh, so it was assumed our sun was a binary star. Yeah. Now yeah. that biased our government into researching in that direction. So what the government concluded was when they looked on various uh, levels of uh, the light spectrum that are not normally used, they essentially almost doubled the number of stars in our galaxy. Mm. And because of that, they feel that it's uh, fairly certain we've got a brown dwarf companion star, very difficult to see, that goes through the Kuiper belt. Not the Oort cloud, but the Kuiper belt about once every uh, 500 million years and basically is the trigger for the mass extinctions. Not because it sends any planetary bodies within the solar system proper, uh, the planet X3, all that stuff, that has nothing to do with that spectacular nonsense. It just means that it creates a horrible disequilibrium in the Kuiper belt that's even worse because it sends uh, asteroids, bolides, planetoids into the inner system that essentially pelt our Earth that help aid the mass extinctions that apparently coincide with extreme volcanism on Earth that already depletes the oxygen, but it's really the depletion mm -hmm. of the oxygen, not the bolide strikes that kills us. So why they're assuming the mass extinction might have sooner than calculated at 250 million years is because the environmental scientists that are their advisors are convincing them that what we are experiencing with the anoxic oceans and the creation of further and further anaerobic uh, bacteria through the anoxic oceans is going to make a Vulcan, a, 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 Vulcan, a volcanic deoxygenation incident occur uh, prior by hundreds of millions of years to that orbit of this binary star, which is in a, in a highly elliptic orbit. Uh, is anything that, about this star going to be in the visual spectrum at all? Well, no, and it's, it's not going to impact us, like I said, for 250 million years. It's, the only reason I bring it up is to show that it's not part of the equation. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, but rather what you're preparing for is something different, something terrestrial, and uh, let's talk about some of the practical aspects of it. I don't believe the world is going to be entirely deoxygenated. They're preparing for the absolute worst-case scenario. Uh, they are really far more intent on financing these mad scientists for the sake of perf you know, perfecting a non-complaining labor force that they don't have to pay, that they don't have to feed, that doesn't need sleep cycles, a 24-hour-a-day automated system based on biology. That's what they're trying to develop. And so that could go wrong in any number of ways, the primary being prions, which is a totally different subject. We don't want to go into that right now, but that is what would lead to feral zombies. Prion is an acronym for proteinaceous infectious ion, and that is what would lead the zombie, Z-O-M-B-I, and turn them into zombies, Z-O-M-B-I-E, <laughs> with an S, if they're plural. Okay, so that's the point. Now, what do we do in a situation like that? Well, you go instantly back to the Middle Ages, uh, because society collapses, and suddenly, Middle Age technology becomes the key to defending yourself. Now, unknown to most Americans, there are um, literally many castles in the United States. There are over 70 castles in New England. There are that many again in New York State alone. There are about 30 castles each in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and there's 25 in Illinois. So that's about 225 militarily registered, actual, honest to God, no bullshit castles with their own water system. They're not fairy tale castles like at Disneyland. These are actual defensible castles. They were built uh, by eccentric millionaires, reactionary prison architects, and occasionally genuine European aristocrats throughout the and United these, States. And these castles are castle castles, like, like you know, yeah. like King Arthur's, like, it's a big fort and the king lives in the fort kind of castle. 
Yes, they were all built before the 1930s when the United States government made it illegal. Okay. <laughs> because without any nearby artillery or government, their potential truly blossoms, and whoever is master of that castle is master of the land. Hmm. You see, I, I so, was always gunning. I was always gunning for uh, for the max security prison, like season three of Walking Dead. <laughs> well, they they want to take your attention away from something like this to something like that, because at that point you're contending with all the inmates that you have to fight for that prison. Oh yeah, a, that, that's what they do in like the first episode. It's like they 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 seize the uh, they have to seize it, so they have to take out all the zombies in there, plus the resident inmates that didn't uh, uh, turn Walker. <laughs> well, there you go. And the uh, whole point is, why go through that when if you have the money, you can purchase one of these castles. Now, if you don't, then what we're dealing with is a situation where you definitely are faced with the fact that very few people can farm to sustain themselves. And the people who know how to do that, such as the Pennsylvania Amish, are basically going to be taken out instantly by roving biker gangs because they don't believe in war and they don't believe in resistance. So your best bet is to hang out with people like that as their defense. And yeah. they feed. That is otherwise, you and I and your average American, we're never going to be able to grow any food to sustain ourselves through year after year after year. Now, I'll give you an example. That dude I told you about who was unemployable because he was overeducated and is now confined the rest of his life to playing video games in the uh, destitute, run-down uh, home uh, without a roof over the garage that he inherited from his grandparents, uh, and without which he'd be homeless. Yeah. Now, this individual, basically, his mom, who is now sadly deceased, was once dating a man. And he asked the guy, you know, he, the guy was asking, what do you do? And, of course, he told him all his sad story, and the guy laughed at him. And so he said in self-defense, well, what do you do? And the guy said, I'm a survivalist. And he couldn't get it. He, he was asking me about that. What does he mean, I'm a survivalist? He said it like it was a job. And I said, that's what it is. If you truly are a survivalist, that's your career. There's really no such thing as an effect of like, oh, you know, I actually work for a living, but as a side, you know, I'm kind of uh, dabbling in prepping because that's not going to cut it. If you don't go all out, balls to the wall, you'd have to be either so rich that you can afford to go the road warrior lifestyle and start armoring your vehicle, you're starting to dig your own well, you're starting to do all this good stuff that gives you uh, sustenance, mainly in terms of water more than anything else. If you don't have the money to do that, then you're screwed. Or if you're so poor that you've been doing that all the time anyway, then you're set. <laughs> so you either got to be really rich <laughs> or really poor because really poor people, like the homeless, have been doing that forever anyway. Now, the majority of the homeless are going to die too because the majority of the homeless are parasitizing off of urban water pipes. They're parasitizing off of all kinds of <laughs> urban infrastructure that they're not paying for, living in subways, living off of, you know, living in manholes, that kind of stuff. They're, just, well, yeah, they're, 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 they're surviving off of the un, uh, the un, uh, supervised aspects of the infrastructure of a successful economy or, yes, or sustained yes. economy. Well, uh, or, or disintegrating economy. <laughs> well, it's disintegrating <laughs> now, correct, yeah. Yeah. But uh, in terms of uh, putting this into perspective, what you are going to be dealing with after billions of people die worldwide and millions of people die in the United States, and these city-states are literally going to be what we would consider today to be dead cities. Uh, they're going to be essentially mayoralties, and their population is going to be literally uh, 5%. To 30 percent, if they're lucky, of their pre-fall population. So larger cities like Chicago would probably have something like a population uh, of about three million, and uh, initially, which would quickly die off. I'm, I'm not talking about now. They've got millions now. It would die off quickly to something far smaller, uh, and uh, basically, towards the lower end of the ratio, you're going to get all kinds of uh, basically empty towers which are going to be used to grow food and they're going to have every level with hydroponic gardens to grow food in abandoned skyscrapers you're going to see the greening of the cities people living off of this 
and you're going to see them guarded by militia. So you're going to see these paramilitary mayoral guards develop where you're going to have probably like Chicago, again, as an example, one of the larger cities of the yeah. mayoralties. I have see a population. Rob Manuel using them too. Yeah, they'd, they'd have a population of just over 200,000. And they would control a rural population, including several smaller towns like Gary, Indiana, and Aurora, Illinois. Probably a rural population of about 1.8 million or close to 2 million. And that rural population would be doing a great deal to feed the other 200,000 that are in the city. So uh, you'd have a Chicago police force, which would essentially be a military. That would probably be only about 600 men. And they'd bolster it, or hamper it, if you would by about 150 mayoral guardsmen and about several different uh, types of mercenaries. And uh, they'd have ward police, of course. They'd deputize people of about 50 to 100 men each. And then they'd institute a draft uh, if they needed to go to war with other cities. Now, all of this was calculated by think tanks years ago when I was trying to transfer into RAND, MIT, and various think tank corporations. And these are statistics that were never released to the public. Mm. Uh, but they were basing everything on economy of scale, that after a major societal collapse, suddenly all of the coal mines uh, that are considered tapped out would be considered chock full when they're supporting a population that is a fly spec compared to the population they were supporting before. Right. So I mean, also, uh, like they, they kind of hinted at all this stuff, like in Dr. Strangelove. They have a scene towards the end where Dr. Strangelove is calculating how... America would rebuild itself after uh, the nuclear war goes off because they realize it was an inevitability at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's the that's what was going on here, but it wasn't based on nuclear war because much of what we're told about nuclear war is a fantasy and a fallacy. Uh, nobody expected nuclear war because the reality was the majority of American and Soviet scientists knew that many of the nuclear ICBMs, the intercontinental slingshots, the, uh, what they were going to throw at each other, were not going to work. They just knew that uh, it was all jury-rigged. It was all, uh, if they pushed the button to launch it, a high uh, percentage of chance would probably have it explode in the silo. A lot of them really? would just go up and do, yeah, oh, they knew this. They knew this. It was all just a scam. Just so basically, the idea of, you know, there's a silo somewhere, somebody launches a nuclear ICBM or whatever, it's so freaking volatile that it would just blow up in your face with such great degree of likelihood that nobody's really interested in pressing the button just because you'd blow yourself up. Pretty much. That Jeez. was pretty much the balance of terror, and that was the stupidity of it. In terms of the Soviets, that was their scam on their own population to keep the Communist Party in power. In terms of the Americans, uh, it was their scam that still keeps them in power in terms of the Constitutional Republic. In terms of the Soviets, everybody found out because everybody was drinking, everybody was talking. Uh, the men running the silos had the highest suicide rates in the world. And finally, it all leaked out and the Soviet Union collapsed. That was their economy. They did not have a military-industrial complex. They were a military-industrial complex. Their entire existence economically was based on building missiles and their strategic rocket forces, maintaining their military, and it all turned out to be a scam, and they collapsed. And that is essentially what the Americans got going. We're supposedly the world's best defended third world nation. Well, we haven't been able to do anything uh, in terms of security. Uh, your military uh, does not stop the illegal invasion of immigrants from Mexico. And it, these people aren't even, for the most part, armed. <laughs> and they're flowing in. Yeah, so all of the money you're spending is worthless. It, you're not getting any defense. 9-11 proved that. And, of course, a lot of this is inside jobs. It's an inside job with the corporations who need the illegal migrant labor. It's an inside job with the uh, Americans in terms of 9-11. But uh, my point still holds. This place can be taken out in a heartbeat by anyone who's ter determined to do so. So electromagnetic pulse, etc. I've gone into that in past shows. We'll probably go into that in another one at some point in the future. Uh, I might have you guest on my show while we discuss these things. Might be a better way of handling it uh, because okay. of the hours. But I do want to say that one of the best things you can do is to become friendly with everyone in your community. If you live in a city, prepare towards a kind of need to convert the skyscrapers in your city into agricultural hydroponic gardens. Now, this sounds absurd, but then you realize 
the majority of our population lives in cities. You know, I, you know what? Most people want to do that now, regardless of prepping. They want to do that in the hopes of still being a first world country because they like the idea so much because at, it, at the very least it makes food cheaper and it makes uh, and it makes the city look cleaner and people yes. really like that and it's good for the morale of the people and you know if i was a politician i'd be like hell yeah if i didn't have a handler telling me keep these people poor and and and, and working and you know all that crap i say yeah. do it absolutely and in the end the cities become very futile they become uh people are going to be swearing allegiance to their mayor that is going to be their government that is going to be the norm in the united states in the future we're going to have a, a now now look at this um this is true libertarianism when you like look it. at yeah i'm sorry go on no i'm just saying uh i like it hey as long as your city actually like you know treats people right dude city states why the hell not I mean, we already act like that. You know, you blow up Boston, and all of a sudden the suburbs are crawling with tanks. Why? Because the suburbs support the city. Well, you know, there you go. And the well, the point that I'm making is that you are going to have, obviously, with that many cities, you're going to have different types of government. Each one of them will bring out the best and worst in their population. You're going to have multiple cities that are going to be uh, just exclusive. Some of them are going to be black only. Some of them are going to be white only. A great deal of them will be much more cosmopolitan and uh, host uh, people of multiple ethnicities and, uh, of course, uh, also mixed race births. And uh, imagine like uh, half a thousand Hong Kongs and half a thousand Singapores, and you've got an economy that is truly much better than what you had before because Hong Kong and Singapore are wealthy enough as cities to afford as cities to afford MRI machines to afford medical treatment, to afford, uh, as in the case of Singapore, their own military. So this is what's going to happen. National Guard Air Force uh, jets being confiscated, uh, defending the airspace of a local city, uh, large ones like New York or uh, Austin or Dallas, places like that. That's easy to foresee. Yeah, they could just use the existing Port Authority infrastructure for New York. Yeah, well, in terms of uh, Texas, they will probably maintain their coherence as a nation. Uh, Texas would be one of the few places that can maintain itself as an internal empire, as Texas. Uh, hmm. Of that, I have no doubt. So, but uh, that would be like a superpower on the North American continent, as opposed to what many other people are uh, dealing with at the city-state level, which would still be superpowers in their own right. Uh, and you'll see trade leagues like the Hanseatic Trade League form up and down the Mississippi and the Colorado. Now, what you mentioned about the Southwest and his example, and we can go into this at some other uh, program, perhaps your guest on mine, would be the uh, fact that the Colorado River, unfortunately, will probably dry up, and for all intents and purposes, the Southwest will become humanly inhabitable for the overwhelming majority of humanity. Uh, we're talking about a situation, for instance, where electricity makes the uh, plumbing work and electricity makes the, pi the, uh, the pumps work. So people won't be able to get oil out of gas stations. That oil may as well be on Mars. People won't be able to uh, use toilets in major cities, so everything needs to be restructured to work on a gravity well, system. Well yeah, with, with the systematic uh, crippling of uh, of this government, they're probably going to have some level of, like, the shadow tech come out, the free energy devices that have been suppressed and everything else. So I I if we don't have the big environmental disasters occur and we just have an economic collapse which creates these city-state situations, you know, then you can also apply that as well. I is, really that, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. I very much appreciate you bringing that up, Mr. Travesty, because uh, the important thing is we are entering a new dark age, and how long that dark age lasts depends on how much of the newer technologies we can retain. If we enter a new libertarian city-state uh, period, then what we need to make sure is that these city-states are factory states that these factory states are based not on the old technologies or what will be referred to in the future probably as black technologies because of the black smoke that's generated from coal burning, etc. But we would need to refer uh, or base our new economies on post-industrial technologies. So post-industrial technology would be nanotechnologies where you're printing the weapons for your city's army. Ah, where so you're printing, printers, right? Yes. Where <laughs> you're printing, Very nice, yes. 
So that is truly post-industrial. You're no longer dealing with a centralized economy commanding production. You have an autonomous regional production capability that, unlike the experiment conducted in communist China, where Mao Zedong wanted people to try and produce steel in every village, and you cannot produce industrial grade steel in villages because you cannot get a forge or foundry that's large enough within that self-contained community. You need an entire urban infrastructure really to have industrial grade steel. So because of that, that experiment was based more on a militia preparation so that people could build their own firearms or create this kind of real bastardized uh, steel. I forgot there was a special name for it, some kind of uh, um, it just real second grade, lower grade kind of metal that would be utilitarian but in no way, shape, or form fit for modern mechanized warfare, rather fit sure. on militia resistance. So that's what he was trying to create in China. Now, we're trying to go beyond that. If we get to that level, we are truly desperate. We're trying to get to the point where we have nanotechnologies that can maintain a prosperity in these cities. Unfortunately, we'll go through a dark age, which all too many people will die off, and many of these technologies may be lost. That is why we've got to think of as people, they have seed banks where the elite are trying to preserve seeds, for in case Monsanto's Terminator seed goes worldwide and kills off all organic seeds and leaves us all starving, the elite will have seeds to grow their own food yeah. and to ultimately repopulate the world with viable uh, reproductive botanicals. Now, we need...